Talking politics, tracking results from two closely watched Republican primaries. Plus, so very involved uh, in my church and my faith life. So that's just an important part of who I am. A profile of a Catholic pro-life candidate who is challenging for a congressional seat in Virginia. Predicting population. Analysis from a new UM projection for the future size of the human family. And church and state. A group of Catholics protests religious intimidation in one Latin American country. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, August 17th, 2022. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being with us tonight. I'm Eric Rosales, in for Tracy Sable. A federal court holds another hearing tomorrow about the FBI's search of former President Donald Trump's Florida estate. At issue is whether to unseal witness statements that were the basis of an FBI search on August 8th. The Justice Department wants to keep those records secret as part of its investigation, but the former president must now tell the court if he wants the documents publicly released. And joining us now to discuss is Ken Cuccinelli, former Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security and Senior Fellow for Homeland Security and Immigration for the Center for Renewing America. Mr. Cuccinelli, thank you so much for joining us again. And we'll start off with uh, the raid on, on Donald Trump's home, President Trump's home. How important do you think it is for Americans to have the opportunity to read the affidavit and understand the justification behind this raid at Mar-a-Lago? So I was an attorney general in Virginia, and um, and I would characterize this raid as in a very small category of activities that, even if they find a way to legitimize it, raises questions because it gets outside of just criminal law. Um, this gets beyond the National Records Act. All the rest of us in America seeing it question whether this is the weaponization of law enforcement. And so it is incumbent upon the attorney general in particular, Director Ray as well, but the attorney general uh, Garland should have already been prepared to immediately fully explain the rationale behind this. This is not the usual investigation where you say, sorry, we don't talk during an investigation. This needs to be explained for the legitimacy of the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And that means not their spin, but literally releasing the documents on which they based uh, the request in the first place to get the warrant, because it doesn't take much to get a warrant. Probable cause is not a hard standard to achieve. Um, but when you look back over six years in particular with the FBI, the, the left-leaning politicization and weaponization of federal law enforcement has been severe, it has been one-sided, and it has been, frankly, the kind of thing that threatens Republican principles. And I don't mean Republican Party. I mean constitutional republic. Most definitely. You know, let's switch gears now to the border, the southern border, the crisis there. You know, Customs yeah. and Border Protection's July numbers show a 203 percent increase from last month in just fentanyl seizures over at the southern border. You know, what do you, what do you make of this? And, and shouldn't we be enforcing the laws that are already in place? Yeah, so the open borders policy of the Biden administration, which they are vigorously pursuing. And by the way, ordinary Democrats in America don't support these policies. This is not a Republican-Democrat thing. This is a very slim portion of the ideological left that the president is responding to. And it isn't just the seizures that are up uh, at the border of fentanyl. We'll just stay with fentanyl, although mm -hmm. it's all hard drugs. If you ask your local police, what's the street price of fentanyl? What was it a year ago? What was it two years ago? You will see one of the purest examples of the law of supply and demand. Even with the massive seizures at the border, so much is coming through with this open borders policy. It's killing Americans by lowering the price of this drug that is so deadly. And it's why every town in America is a border town. All the hard drugs that are killing Americans and creating violence in many of our communities are coming through that southern border, all of them. 
all of them. That didn't used to be the case, not when I was Virginia's attorney general, say, 10 years ago. But and, that is the case now. And no so doubt uh, we support. also have terrorists possibly coming through there as well, correct? Oh, by the, by the score. Um, you know, we had another 50 or 60 on the terror watch list that have only been figured out after the fact that have come through just this fiscal year. And those are just the ones we know about. And those are the folks who have the greatest motivation not to be discovered by Customs Border Protection, by the uh, OFO folks at the legal ports of entry to get by our national security apparatus at the border. So the likelihood is that there are, you know, it's hard to estimate, double that number that are getting through. And these are people that want to kill Americans and bring down the American government. And we have a president and an administration who's willing to let them walk right in. Well, Mr. Cuccinelli, thank you so much for joining us today. The Centers for Disease Control announces an organizational shakeup. The head of the nation's top public agency says the changes will, quote, make it more nimble. Among the new directives are a revamping of the communications department and an emphasis on working better with other U.S. agencies. The CDC has come under heavy criticism for its response to COVID-19. A California appeals court rules that Calvary Chapel San Jose will not have to pay some $200,000 in fines to the local county for holding services, despite COVID-19 social gathering restrictions. The decision cited the recent Supreme Court decision on behalf of freedom of religion. Well, Planned Parenthood wants to influence voters during this year's election cycle, the first since Roe v. Wade was struck down. The abortion advocacy group intends to spend some $50 million in specific races, combined with direct outreach to some 6 million voters. Former President Donald Trump's wish, well, he got his wish in Wyoming. He pushed out one of his biggest Republican critics, the primary results, uh, election results, could have implications for 2022 and 2024. Let's check in with White House correspondent Owen Jensen with this report. Owen. Eric, former President Donald Trump celebrated Congresswoman Liz Cheney's loss, calling the results a complete rebuke of the January 6th committee. Today, Wyoming has spoken. <laughs> Attorney Harriet Hageman wins the Republican primary in Wyoming and claims her victory represents those who believe in liberty. The freedom of speech, freedom of religion, equal protection, and due process come from God. They do not come from government. Hageman's campaign was fueled by former President Donald Trump, who made it his mission to unseat her incumbent challenger, Representative Liz Cheney. And to tell you, our work is far from over. Representative Cheney was one of 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach President Trump. I have said since January 6th that I will do whatever it takes to ensure Donald Trump is never again anywhere near the Oval Office, and I mean it. But former President Trump writes Liz Cheney should be ashamed of herself, and now she can finally disappear into the depths of political oblivion. Good vote. Meanwhile, in Alaska, Senator Lisa Murkowski, another critic of President Trump, advanced from her primary. While Sarah Palin, the GOP's 2008 vice presidential nominee, advanced in the race for Alaska's sole U.S. House seat, Palin received President Trump's endorsement in the race. Also making news today, former Vice President Mike Pence. He traveled to the presidential primary state of New Hampshire and revealed he would consider testifying before the January 6th committee if invited. It would be unprecedented in history for a vice president to be summoned to testify on Capitol Hill. But I, as I said, I don't want to prejudge. Now back to Representative Cheney's loss. Republicans who voted to impeach former President Trump are heading for the exits. Listen to these numbers. Just two of those 10 House members have won their primaries this year. The rest lost or retired. Meantime, President Joe Biden continues his vacation in Delaware, and the First Lady Jill Biden is recovering from COVID-19 in South Carolina. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Owen. Well, the road to the midterm elections is heating up. Several races will decide control of the U.S. House. One such race is Virginia's second congressional district. That's between two-term Democrat incumbent Congresswoman Elaine Loria and Virginia State Senator Jen Kiggins. I sat down with Jen Kiggins, who is Catholic, to talk about her faith 
and political platform. I am a lifelong Catholic, uh, so I prescribe to Catholic values. This is what has shaped me uh, since I was a child. I'm a product of Catholic schools. My kids go to Catholic schools. You know, they're altar serving now. I'm a Eucharistic minister, so very involved uh, in my church and my faith life. So that's just an important part of who I am. Jen Kiggins tells me her faith guides her votes, including her unwavering support for the unborn. As a state senator in Virginia, she tells me she fought the radical extreme measures Democrats have taken after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. I'm running against an opponent, Congresswoman Luria, who has voted for the Women's Health Protection Act, they call it, which allows for abortions up to nine months, so at any time, for any reason, at taxpayer expense. I'm a lifelong pro-life candidate as well. I recognize that there are some women in crisis and this is a sensitive issue, but I also am a person who has advocated for life in the State House. She is a 10-year Navy veteran flying helicopters during two deployments to the Persian Gulf, and her husband is a former Navy fighter pilot. She says the Biden administration has not prioritized the military and is putting our nation at risk. And I worry about her standing on the world stage. I really feel like we're not the deterrent that we used to be. Uh, we are perhaps not the mil as, as strong as the military as we should be. I, I believe that, you know, again, peace through strength. And I worry that our friends are not trusting us and our enemies are not fearing us right now. Another thing you'd like to see is medical reform, health care reform. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I want to provide good primary preventative care because this helps, helps to save health care costs in the future. Health care reform is important, but specifically for our geriatric and aging population and the state level, nursing home reform has been a really impart, important piece of things I have advocated for, uh, as, long as, or as well as uh, advocating for our providers. As for her opponent, Congresswoman Elaine Luria, Kiggins says she's out of step with what Americans want lawmakers to deal with on Capitol Hill, like inflation not Select the January 6th commission. January 6th. There's not a single person I talk to who says, you know what I really care about is January 6th. What's, what's going on with January 6th? It's a very one-sided investigation. We never hear from the other side, and she's fundraised a lot off of this. But it really, in my opinion, just demonstrates how she doesn't understand what the voters here care about. She adds voters are interested in kitchen table issues. We care about paying our bills. We care about affording gas and groceries. We care about taking care of our families. We care about supporting law enforcement. You know, we care about safe communities and our kids' education. So these are the things we care about. Virginia's 2nd Congressional District is neither red nor blue, but is almost an equal mix of Republicans and Democrats, a race that both parties' national operations have poured money into, a race right now rated by election analysts as a toss-up. If voters are on the fence, what do you want to tell them to have them vote for you? My opponent and I are interestingly go head to head in a lot of areas. We're both Navy veterans. We are both women. We are both moms. We are both elected officials. So we both have voting records. It's important that they understand what she has voted for. She votes with Nancy Pelosi 98% of the time. This is not something she will tell you. She will run an entire campaign off of playing to be a moderate when she in reality is not. You've got to have the right candidate who understands that, who can really represent this district well. It is important to note that EWTN News Nightly did reach out to Kiggin's opponent, opponent, that is, Representative Elaine Loria. We did not receive a response to our emails or calls for an interview. Coming up, the latest developments in the tensions between China and Taiwan. Plus, what the United Nations is saying about the future of the world's population. Welcome back. A protest at Nicaragua's embassy in Mexico City calls attention to the Ortega government's hostility towards the Catholic Church. During this month, national police have kept Bishop Rolando Alvarez and several other priests under house arrest while conducting an investigation. They searched for the pastor of another local church yesterday. The government also raided and shut down several Catholic radio stations. China defends its war games near Taiwan following a visit by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi earlier this month. A spokesperson calls the exercises proportionate to rebuke a U.S. official who accused Beijing of overreacting. China is continuing military operations today east of the island. Taiwan has raised objections, responding with drills of its own to prepare against a possible invasion. The United Nations projects the population will break 
10.4 billion people during the 2080s. Earlier estimates believe that the population would peak about 10.8 billion people by the year 2100. And joining us now is Austin Roos, president of the Center for Family and Human Rights. Austin, welcome back. Now talk to us more about this United Nations projection for population and why the United Nations changed its previous estimates. Well, the, first of all, it should be understood that the report is published by the UN Population Division. Uh, there's a there's a part of the United Nations called the UN Population Fund, which is you know aggressive population controllers. The UN Population Division are you know fairly objective demographers uh, who have been putting out projections now for a very long time. Um, I recall many years ago that they had an, an alarmist panel wondering how low fertility could go. This was 25 years ago, and the answer then was they didn't know how low it could go. Well, right now, uh, the fertility of China is 1.3 uh, children per woman, uh, and India is at 2.2. So therefore, in the next few years, and certainly by 2086, India will be the most populous nation in the world. Mm. And what do you think is contributing to this smaller peak population size? Well, you know, the, <laughs> you know, the United Nations has spent 25 years drilling into the minds of people that uh, were uh, going to be uh, flooded with people, that the, <laughs> the, the overpopulation scares that we've known, that we've experienced now for 60, 75 years. So a lot of people have internalized that. There have been forced abortions in many countries, mm. um, you know, forced population control programs in China, for instance, which is one of the reasons they're at 1.3 children per woman. So uh, social marketing and in some cases force has resulted in women having fewer children. So th this is uh, the the, uh, the new uh, population projections in 2086 are a direct result of all of this. Can you talk to us a little bit about why all this matters, especially when some argue that the world is already overpopulated? Well, you know, it's very interesting because the UN Population Division began having some panels over the last 20 years about the aging of, of the population and how the population pyramid has changed substantially. It was, I think, 30 years ago that Japan began uh, hit, hit this particular point where they had more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 15. This is a recipe for disaster. And this is the real problem that many demographers have been talking about uh, for the past decade or more, and that is the aging of the population and the resulting strain on social service programs. So th this, is, this is probably the problem. that There was a, a, a film out a few years ago called Demographic Winter that, that looked mm. uh, very specifically at this problem. Uh, the problem in the world is not overpopulation. The problem in the world is that people are, in fact, having too few children and populations are aging and uh, stress is being put on social service programs. I have to tell you, I mean, when you take a look at 10.8 billion people by the year 2100, um, uh, can the world survive with that many people? You know, one of the things that I ask people to do uh, who are worried a little bit about overpopulation is the next time you're flying from coast to coast or practically anywhere in the United States and certainly anywhere in the world at night, look down. And what you'll see are hardly any lights anywhere. Uh, the exp what we're experiencing is urbanization. So you'll look at a, uh, at a, at a city like Mexico City uh, mm. with you know, 20 billion people or New York City or, or any of the other major population centers around the world. But for the most part, if you fly at night anywhere in the world, look down and you'll see very few lights. What that means is that there's a lot of room for us to grow. Definitely. Good insight there. I thank you so much, Austin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Up next, what the Holy Father is asking of the elderly and the young as a blessing to the world. Pope Francis says an alliance between old and young will save the human family. La testimonianza degli anziani unisce l'età della vita e le stesse dimensioni del tempo. At his weekly talk to pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father says the elderly can share their experiences and young people can listen, learn, and implement life lessons. The Holy Father also greeted, was greeted by a young boy who approached the stage and he ended up remaining there for several minutes. How wonderful is that? 
Well, finally tonight, a new online training program seeks to teach people about an issue close to the heart of Pope Francis. The Laudato Si animators are part of a global movement of tens of thousands of people. They are committed to prayer and the Holy Father's actions to care for our common home. The course begins later this month. Joining us now is Aaron Lothis, theologian, professor of the, and member of the Lothotho C movement. Professor, great to see you again. Great to be here. Can you tell us more about this course and what sort of things are being taught and how many people are taking part in this? Sure. Well, the Laudato Si Animators program is a six-week program of spiritual formation and leadership training that equips Catholics to lead spirituality and sustainability projects in their own parishes. And we conduct this program around the world with 30,000 fully certified animators already part of our global movement of prayer and action, and 2,000 right here in the United States. And during our program, we have amazing expert speakers who share about Catholic social teaching, especially Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. We learn about ecological spirituality, sustainability, the climate impacts that are hurting the poor around the world and that we can all see in our daily news headlines and shows us all how to be leaders in our own parishes, doing the kind of work that is building up our creation and honoring God's beautiful world that he made for all of us. And this is really an honor to be part of the Lodato C animator, correct? It's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's open to all. It's a free program. It's online, so it's very accessible. Uh, anyone can register at laudatocanimators.org. In fact, our next session is beginning next week, next Wednesday, August 24th. So you can join us at either 9 a.m. Eastern time or 9 p.m. Eastern time for our four webinars and our uh, concluding action program. In fact, we have a graduation just after the Feast of St. Francis, who everyone knows is the beloved saint of ecology and uh, creation care. That's October 4th. And we talked a little bit uh, about this, and you mentioned it. The season of creation begins September 1st and ends on the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. And what sort of projects are being planned for this year's season? Well, around the world, every kind of project you can think of, people are holding green masses, celebrating mass outside where they can just glory in God's creation, our natural cathedrals, so to speak. People are conducting tree plantings, which are so important for combating erosion, protecting water supplies, creating shade. People are doing cleanups. People are learning how to compost and recycle. People are bringing energy efficiency projects to their parishes, saving money, increasing efficiency, and reducing demand for fossil fuels. So that's just a short list of the sort of projects that animators can do. Oh, wonderful. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. And again, God bless you. Thank you so much. Lots of fun there. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. Thanks for so much for watching. I'm Eric Rosales from all of us here at EWTN News Nightly. Have yourself a wonderful night and God bless.